Hello Year 11s, welcome to this video on Lawmaking by Parliament. Before we start, I'd like to introduce you to some of the more interesting Prime Ministers that we've had in Australia. In the top right hand corner, we have Sir Edmund Barton. Sir Edmund Barton was the first Prime Minister of Australia. Since him, there have been 29 Prime Ministers. Our current Prime Minister is Scott Morrison, down on the left hand side of this slide. He is Australia's 30th Prime Minister. In the top left hand corner, we have Sir Robert Menzies. He is Australia's longest serving Prime Minister. He was Prime Minister of Australia for 18 years and 5 months. In the bottom left hand corner, we have Francis Ford. He is Australia's shortest serving Prime Minister. He was Prime Minister for only eight days. He became Prime Minister after the previous Prime Minister, John Curtin, suddenly died in office and before the Prime Ministership was taken over by Ben Chifley. On the right, we have Julia Gillard. She is Australia's only female Prime Minister. And down at the bottom, we have Harold Holt. Harold Holt is the only Prime Minister of Australia to have died by drowning. In fact, he's the only known leader of a country in the world to have died by drowning. There are three things that you need to do while you're listening to this video. The first thing is to take the very best Cornell notes that you can. The second thing is to use the pause and rewind functions. Use the pause function if you need to stop this video so that you can take notes. Use the rewind function if you feel that you've missed out on any information and you need to go back over that information. The third thing that you need to do is have your vocabulary sheets open in front of you so that you can write into them any definitions of important words or indeed the definitions of any words that you're unfamiliar with. Once you've finished watching this video, you need to read the pages of the textbook referred to on this slide. And if you find any additional information from that reading that you think is useful, then supplement your Cornell notes with that additional information. Here is our learning intention. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the process used by Parliament to make laws. Please make sure that you write this learning intention down in your Cornell notes. You'll recall that we have been looking at the different sources of law. There are two sources of law. First, there is law made by the courts when they decide cases. This is called common law. Common law consists of precedents, that is, legal rules or principles, made by judges when they are dealing with a new case that is not covered by existing legal rules or principles, or when they are interpreting a statute that has been made by Parliament. As we've seen, the main role of the courts is actually to resolve disputes. However, as part of resolving a dispute, a judge may need to decide what the law is, that is, make a new legal rule or new legal principle. In this video, we look at a different source of law, that is, Parliament. Unlike the courts, Parliament's main role is to make laws. The laws that are made by Parliament are called statutes. Statutes are also known as Acts of Parliament or legislation. There is a very important principle that you need to understand when you are talking about the power of Parliament to make laws. This is the principle of the supremacy or sovereignty of Parliament. According to this principle, Parliament has the final lawmaking power. Now this means two things. First, Parliament can repeal, that is remove, and amend, that is change, its own laws. That is, Parliament can repeal or amend statutes that it has previously passed. Second, Parliament can make laws that change or abrogate, that is, override, court-made law. In other words, if Parliament wants to, it can make a law that replaces or overturns the common law, 
that is made by judges. This means that Parliament can make a law that changes a precedent established by a court, or that changes the meaning of a word in a statute where a court has interpreted that word in a particular way. In your vocabulary sheets, I'd like you to go to the end where there are some blank spaces and write in the term supremacy or sovereignty of Parliament. And then write next to that term a definition of the supremacy or sovereignty of Parliament. On this slide I have set out some important points that you must keep in mind. First, a proposed law which is introduced into Parliament is known as a bill. Look down the left hand side of your vocabulary sheets, find the term bill and write this definition in there. It's only if Parliament passes that bill that it then becomes an act of Parliament. Second, laws are made by Parliament, not by the government. The government introduces bills into Parliament, but it is Parliament which decides whether to pass those bills. That is, it is Parliament which decides whether a bill should become a law. It does this by passing the bill so that the bill then becomes an act. Third, a bill must be passed by both Houses of Parliament before it can become a law. If the bill is a proposed law for Australia, then the bill will be introduced into the Commonwealth Parliament. For that proposed law to become an actual law, the bill must be passed by both the House of Representatives and the Senate. On the other hand, if the bill is a proposed law for Victoria, then the bill will be introduced into the Victorian Parliament. For that proposed law to become an actual law, the bill must be passed by both the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Council. Finally, a bill must pass through a number of stages in Parliament before it can become a law. This slide sets out all the stages that a bill must pass through before it can come into operation as an actual law. In the following slides, I explain each of these stages in more detail. The first stage is the first reading. This is where the bill, or proposed law, is introduced into the first house. Now, bills are typically introduced by the government into the lower house of parliament. For the Commonwealth Parliament, this is the House of Representatives, and for the Victorian Parliament, this is the Legislative Assembly. The reason for this is that the government generally has the majority of members in the lower house. Remember that this is why the lower house is called the House of Government. Because the government has the majority of members and therefore the majority of votes in the lower house, the government can be sure that the bill will be passed by the lower house. However, increasingly it's the case that governments do not have the majority of members in the upper house, that is, in the Senate in the case of the Commonwealth Parliament, or in the Legislative Council in the case of the Victorian Parliament. This means that it can be more difficult for the government to have its bills passed by the upper house. Where the government doesn't have the majority of members in the upper house, it must rely on the votes of other members of the upper house to pass its bills. These necessary votes could come from the opposition or from the crossbenchers. Now in the first reading, the minister gives notice of intention to introduce the bill, reads the title of the bill, and moves that the bill be read a first time. There is no debate, that is, there's no discussion about the bill. This stage is a very short stage and can be completed in a few minutes. Copies of the bill are also circulated to all members of the House, and this is the first time that many of these members will have seen the bill. In the Commonwealth Parliament, Members are also provided with an explanatory memorandum which explains the reason for the bill and outlines its provisions. This is intended to help the members understand the bill. Bills can be very lengthy and complex and so it can be very useful to be provided with a guide about the bill. 
If the majority of members of the House vote in favour of the bill being read a first time, then the bill proceeds to the next stage. Now note that even though we refer to the bill as being read, the bill is not actually read out in Parliament. If the majority of members of the House vote in favour of the bill being read a first time, then this just means that the majority of members have voted in favour of the bill passing the first reading. Once the bill has passed the first reading, then it proceeds to the next stage. Now in your vocabulary sheets, look down the left hand side and find the term first reading. I want you then to include a short description of the first reading in your vocabulary sheets. The second stage is the second reading. There are two parts to the second reading. These are the second reading speech and the second reading debate. As I've explained before, ministers have different areas of responsibility. The minister who is responsible for a bill will be the minister whose department deals with the matters that are covered by the bill. For example, where the bill is about education, the responsible minister will be the minister for education. In such a case, the Minister for Education will introduce the bill into Parliament in the first reading, and it will be this Minister who gives the second reading speech. The second reading speech is often made shortly after the bill passes the first reading. In the second reading speech, the Minister outlines the purpose of the bill and the reasons the House should pass the bill. It is at this stage that, in the case of bills in the Victorian Parliament, the members of the House are provided with a report on the compatibility of the bill with the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. The Charter of Human Rights sets out many important rights that individuals have, such as the right to freedom of religion and the right to freedom of speech. And the purpose of this report is to highlight any areas where the bill is inconsistent with these rights. It's then up to the Victorian Parliament whether to pass the bill as it is, or whether to amend the bill so that it ceases to be inconsistent with these rights, or whether to reject the bill in its entirety. After the second reading speech, debate is adjourned, that is postponed, um, to give time for members to consider the bill and to consult with the public about the bill. In your vocabulary sheets, look down the left hand side and find the term second reading speech. I then want you to include opposite that term a short description of the second reading speech. The second part of the second reading is the second reading debate. This debate is generally held at least two weeks after the second reading speech so that members have had sufficient time to properly consider and consult on the bill. Now during the second reading speech the responsible minister has already given the government's reasons as to why the House should pass the bill and so the second reading debate commences with a speech by the shadow minister. So, for example, if the bill is about education, then it will be the Shadow Minister for Education who gives this speech. In this speech, the Shadow Minister will outline the opposition's views on the bill, and whether the opposition intends to vote in favour of the bill, or to make changes to the bill, or to vote against the bill. After the Shadow Minister's speech, other members of the House members of the government, members of the opposition and the crossbenchers have the opportunity to explain their views on the bill. The House then votes on whether the bill should be read a second time. If the majority of members of the House vote in favour of the bill being read a second time, then the bill proceeds to the next stage. Again, if the majority of members uh, vote in favour of the bill being read a second time, this does not mean that the bill is actually read out in Parliament. It just means that the majority of members have voted in favour of the bill proceeding to the next stage. In your vocabulary sheets, look down the left hand side and find the term second reading debate. I then want you to include there a short summary of the second reading debate. You can now also include in your vocabulary sheets a definition of the second reading. 
you'll find the term second reading in the left hand side of your vocabulary sheets. You might for example like to write that the second reading is when the responsible minister gives the second reading speech and the House debates the merits of the bill during the second reading debate. This brings us to the third stage in the passage of a bill through Parliament. This stage is the committee stage. During the committee stage, the members work through the bill clause by clause. Each clause is discussed in detail and amendments that are proposed, that is moved, by members to each clause are debated and voted on. An amendment to a clause is only made if the majority of members of the House vote in favour of that amendment. If all of the members of the House agree, then it's possible to skip the committee stage. This will generally be the case with simple bills that are unanimously supported by all of the parties that are represented in that House of Parliament. Now the committee stage is called different things in the lower and upper houses. In the lower house, that is in the House of Representatives for the Commonwealth Parliament and the Legislative Assembly for the Victorian Parliament, the committee stage is called consideration in detail. In the upper house, that is in the Senate for the Commonwealth Parliament and in the Legislative Council for the Victorian Parliament, the committee stage is called the Committee of the Whole. Where the bill has been amended during the committee stage, then it is this bill, as amended, that passes to the next stage. Now in your vocabulary sheets, look down the left hand side, find the term committee stage and write there a short description of the committee stage. The fourth stage in the passage of the bill through Parliament is the third reading. During this stage, the title of the bill is read, there may be further debate on the bill, and it's even possible that the members might agree to make further amendments to the bill. The members of the House then vote on the bill in its final form, that is, they vote on the bill as amended, if at all, during the committee stage and the third reading. If the majority of members vote in favour of the bill being read a third time, this does not mean that the bill is actually read out in Parliament. All it means is that the bill has been passed by that House of Parliament. In your vocabulary sheets, look down the left hand side, find the term third reading and include there a short summary of the third reading. Well, the fun hasn't ended yet. If the bill is passed by the first house in the third reading, then this whole procedure is repeated in the second house. That is, in the second house, the bill must pass through a first reading, a second reading with a second reading speech and second reading debate, the committee stage and a third reading. As I've explained, bills are generally first passed by the lower house and are then sent to the upper house. Now one person can't be a member of both the lower house and the upper house, so the role of the responsible minister in the lower house will be undertaken in the upper house by another member of the government, generally a minister who has been elected to be a member of the upper house. Of course it's possible that the bill will be amended by the upper house in the committee stage or in the third reading. You'll remember that a bill must be passed by both Houses of Parliament before it can become a law. This means that a bill must be passed in the same form by both Houses of Parliament before it can become a law. If the second House makes amendments to the bill, then the bill, as amended by the second House, must be sent back to the first House for the first House to vote on those amendments. In the first house, we don't go through all of these stages again. Instead, the members of the first house simply vote on whether to pass the bill as amended by the second house. If the first house votes to pass the bill as amended by the second house, then the bill has been passed by Parliament. If the first house votes not to pass the bill as amended by the second house, then the bill does not pass and it cannot become a law. 
Assuming that a bill has been passed by both the lower house and the upper house in the same form, then there are a few last steps which need to be taken before the bill can finally become a law. First, the bill must be certified by the Clerk of Parliament, who is an Officer of Parliament, as having been passed in identical form by both Houses. Second, the Governor-General, in the case of a bill passed by the Commonwealth Parliament, or the Victorian Governor, in the case of a bill passed by the Victorian Parliament, must give royal assent to the bill. Royal assent is the signing of a bill by the Crown's representative. That is, the Governor-General, where the bill has been passed by the Commonwealth Parliament, and the Governor, where the bill has been passed by the Victorian Parliament. A bill cannot come into force as a law until it has been given royal assent. Now, as a matter of practice, the Governor-General or the Governor will always give royal assent to a bill that has been passed by Parliament. Look down the left-hand side of your vocabulary sheets, Find the term Royal Assent and write that definition of Royal Assent in there. Once a bill has received Royal Assent, then we refer to it as an Act. The final stage is Proclamation. If the Act itself states the day on which it comes into operation, then the Act will come into operation as a law on that day. However, if the Act itself does not state the date, on which it will come into operation, then the Act will come into operation as a law on the day that is proclaimed, that is published by the Governor-General acting on the advice of the Commonwealth Government in the case of Commonwealth Acts, or the Victorian Governor acting on the advice of the Victorian Government in the case of Victorian Acts. In such a case, the proclamation date is published in a publication called the Government Gazette. Well, that now brings us to the end of this video. Please make sure that you read the pages of the textbook referred to on the first slide. And if you find any additional information from that reading that you think is useful, supplement your Cornell notes with that information. Having listened to this video and taken your notes, you should now be able to describe the process used by Parliament to make laws. Thank you for your attention.